Apostle Paul, he wrote the church in Thessalonica, and he said, look, in everything, give thanks. Not for, but in everything. Thank you, Lord. And I don't know about you, I got a lot to be thankful for tonight. Amen? He woke me up this morning. Some people didn't wake up this morning. I had part of my right mind. I'm glad about that. And I can say, thank you. The majority of my friends that I grew up with are either dead or in jail. Mark Abrams grew up in North Philly in a time where gang violence ruled the streets and drugs were taking over the minds of the youth. You never knew what to expect, but you always knew something was happening. That was just the fear of wondering, like, where, where would life take you? I remember in the fifth grade, I was 10 years old. I went to um, run an errand for my teacher to go pick up her lunch. And when I left the store, two guys came and they robbed me at gunpoint. And they took my teacher's lunch, my lunch, and they took all the change that I had left. It was just crazy. Just on the basketball court, almost every other day it was a shooting. And right before they would start shooting, they said, young boys, y'all better get out of here because we can get it on. And it would be like in a matter of five minutes, it was like, pow, 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 pow. We would take cover over people's houses. We would run. Only thing would be left in the schoolyard was the basketball bouncing. My mother was a single mom of six children. One of the you know, things I remember most is just how we were gonna make it financially. We didn't have the money to get oil, so it would be really cold. We would use the oven to keep the house warm. But then on the other side of all the struggles, she somehow found the Lord in it, or the Lord found her in it. Oh, in my mother's house, the rules was, if you live in my house, everybody's going to church. Magnolia was a talented singer and taught Mark to sing gospel music. We had an old dusty piano around the house where she would sit around and play this piano. We would all gather around. And she had this really, really toughness about you had to do it right. And she was really, really neurotic with like, this is the note, this is how it sounds, this is how you need to sing this. Mark became passionate about singing and dreamed about one day becoming a famous singer. Magnolia encouraged Mark to use his talents in church, singing worship, but Mark had other ideas. I got a weekend job on Sundays at Geno's. And in that job, I started meeting other people from the world who didn't have the same values my mom taught us. Started thinking, look what she's been holding out on us with, and look how, you know, she's been all strict. We can't go to parties, we can't go smoke weed, we can't, you know, drink. And now, you know, she got us in the church, and I sort of like walked away from the church from it. I was like, man, no, nah, that's nice, but this is another world. And that influence of the world took me on a long journey. From about the age of 14, to about the age of 32, 33, I just lived any kind of way. Started buying weed, angel dust, cocaine, started bagging it up, we started selling it. And as we was making money from it, and we created a little business. We would sell it in the bars, we would hang in the bars, we would hang in different clubs. Then we started going to go-go places where go-go girls were. Snorting cocaine for days sometime, you know, and just this whole life. And you just live like that, and it's just, you got tired of it, but you didn't know how to get out of it. Mark continued singing. Only now, he was singing in bars and clubs. I wasn't really serious about my craft or about my talent. I was more interested in like, if I make this money, I'm gonna get a bunch of girls, I'm gonna move to LA. You know, I was more thinking about what I could get, not what I could give. 
Mark's talent was noticed by a major record label, and he was offered a record deal that would launch his career as a professional singer. We had this record up coming, everything was set. <clears throat> we recorded downtown and, and at a studio, we was recording different places. And the record deal was basically set for me to go into something really pretty big. And um, bingo, that's when the Lord came in. Me, my brother, and one of my best friends were out and on that particular night, and I remember that the Lord just spoke to my heart and said, you know, this is it. This is your last night out. I didn't know what that meant. Um, it wasn't an audible voice, but it was like clearly to my heart, like, this is it. And it was on the dance floor. I'm standing on the sideline. I'm not dancing. I'm, and broken heart, you know, my heart broken. And I walk over to my brother and my friend. I said, look, we got to get out of here. Mark notes this experience as the moment he was saved. In an instant, he gave his life over to Christ. I came home, I started pouring out Hennessy, cognac. I was saying, well, how could I waste all this time? How could I, how could I waste all this time, Lord? It was sad, you know, just looking back and saying, Lord, how could I, how could I not, not know you love me? How could I not know that I had a mother that wanted to teach me what was right? I was crying my eyes out. Every song I ever was taught as a child, Every hymn, every, you know, thing my mother tried to teach me as a kid, it all seemed like it came to life and like, it was just so real to me. I knew that I had to break away from the music world and what it entailed, you know, the women, the parties, the drugs, the compromise. And I wanted to be a no compromise person. I wanted to make a choice. And I had to choose one or the other. It couldn't be both for me. And I chose the Lord and the Lord only. Mark decided to pass on the opportunity with the record label and began following his new passion. I felt like the Lord was tugging at my heart. Saying, you need to go out to your old neighborhood. You need to go out to the college campuses. You need to go everywhere and tell people about Jesus. The first person I witnessed to was my mailman. You know, I didn't have a Bible verse, but I just told him like, I'm saved, I don't drink coarse lights no more. And he looked at me, the mailman looked at me, you know, and I told him that Jesus saved me. He said, oh man, that's great. You know, he said, that's wonderful. I said, yeah, but he can save you too. And he said, oh, I, I know, I know, I know. From that point forward, Mark and his new friends from church were taking every opportunity they could to share the gospel. We went out to this area where it was like a school and a track where you run track on and was this particular man sitting by himself on the bleachers. And I just sensed the Lord said, go over to this man and um, share Jesus. Well, he was 6'4", he was a black guy, 6'4", probably 280, 320, somewhere around there. And he had on sunglasses on a day when it wasn't even sunny outside, it was overcast. And he had this big cigar in his mouth and I was like, I'm not going nowhere near that guy. And something kept saying, you gotta go say something to him about Jesus. And then by the time I was ready to just talk to him, I lost my voice, I said, do you wanna hear about Jesus? And he said, speak up, speak up. <laughs> I was scared. And he took off his sunglasses, took his cigar out of his mouth, laid it down and crushed it with his foot. I'm like, oh my God, that could have been me, right? And then I started praying with him and I led him to Christ. And it was amazing because he was just, he started to tear up. I prayed with him the whole time I was looking at him like, look at this big guy, he could kill me. One day, while Mark was waiting to catch a trolley, he met a man who invited him to lead a spiritual group at a local homeless shelter on Monday mornings. So the first time I go to the homeless shelter, these men, they just started like booing me and like, get out of here, boo, get him out of here, get that stuff out of here. We don't want to hear it. And so I, really, I didn't get a chance to share anything. It was just trying to calm them down and say, no, I just want to get to know y'all and, you know, share the love of God and like, get that stuff out of there. So that was the first time. Right, so week after week, I would go to the shelter and they were like, boo, get him out of there. We don't like this guy, you know? And then one week, it sort of got to me. You know, this one guy started calling me names and stuff. It's a stupid idiot. We don't want to hear that. Don't you understand? We don't want to hear what you're talking about. 
It's dumb, it's stupid, you're messing with our TV time, you know, you need to leave. And he kept saying, you're a dummy. And, and I was like, that's it. You're not calling me a dummy no more. And I just ran into the audience and I was like, and then at that time, my wife, she was with me. She's like, you can't beat up a homeless man. I said, oh, yes, I can. <laughs> she sort of got in between me and the people. She said, hold it, wait, you know, calm down, everybody. It was chaotic. And then it was like, I don't know if the Lord called me to do this. You know, it became a headache. I'm like, I don't know. You know, I'm wasting my lunch time coming out here with these guys that they don't even appreciate it. And, and I was really ready to just say, forget those guys. But I just knew that the Lord said, go back. So I get down there this one week and they all like looking at me like, oh, here we go again. And I started singing. And at first it was noisy and halfway through the song, it got real quiet. And they said, oh. You know, and then they started having these song requests. Well, do you know this song? Do you know this song? And I started singing songs. And that changed everything for me. So I was going, well, there's some time more now. You know, I'm in here now and they let me teach. You had a whole group that started being my friend and they were singing with me and so forth. We give an altar call and everybody responded. The whole room, you know, about 200 something people responded to the gospel. Weeping and crying and it was just, I couldn't believe it. You know, I told my wife, I said, what did I say? She said, you didn't say nothing, God spoke <laughs> and they heard God. Mark became known in his community as a man of faith. One of his co-workers asked him to lead a Bible study at work. So I'm going to this Bible study and we get done. And to my surprise, they said, well, can you come back next week? I'm like, no, I'm not coming back next week. It was just a one-time deal. He said, no, you can come back next week. It's open. They need somebody to do it. And it ended up becoming a Bible study. But it didn't stop there. More friends asked Mark to lead additional Bible studies. And Mark agreed. In 2005, Mark's Bible study became a church. But Mark started to notice that some of his members were homeless. There was one particular man that I noticed, his name was Mr. Phil. He always sat on the right-hand side in the first row, and I got wind that he lived in a local shelter. And I said, I wonder if God wants us to start feeding these people. So we talked to him, we're like, you know, Mr. Phil, you know, I want to start putting out food on Sunday. He said, oh, that would be a great idea, you know. But when we turned around, he started inviting people. So it went from feeding one or 10 people to feeding about 1,000 people a month. And we couldn't believe it. We turned around, our whole church was filled with people from almost every shelter on that side of town. You know, and so we were feeding them, we were loving them, we were clothing them. The church focused on generous giving to the poor. Through creative outreaches, they reached thousands of people with the gospel. Um, we had days when we do water ice outreach. We would do this one Sunday we call it Token of Love, where we give homeless people scepter, you know, the transit system here, tokens. And we called it the Token of Love Sunday. And we'd invite them to church and we'd give them a really nice meal and they would have tokens. It drew hundreds of people. And then we would share the gospel and they would get saved and they would come back. Because Mark could relate to their struggles, many of his outreaches focused specifically on single moms. We used to have this one outreach where we'd sit down and do their nails and um, pray with them and do a nice lunch for them. Where one year we gave out a car. You know, a, a mom walked over with a Honda Civic we furnished some houses for moms. We helped them move into houses. We paid a lot of bills. <laughs> the church was called Calvary Chapel Word of Life and became known for its outreach in the community. Word of Life organizes hundreds of outreaches to help men, women, and children in need. I couldn't pay my rent. So I went to pay my rent so my 
landlord said, your rent is already paid. I said, my rent is paid? She said, yes. I'm mean, looking how my rent is paid. She showed me on the book, and it was him. He had paid my rent. I was so happy. That was $448 that I had to myself that month to help out with my kids. We would see people come from all walks of life, but we would also see church people come. And then church people would start saying, hey, you guys can help us do this at our church. And before you know it, we started having churches come to us and ask them, could we train them in evangelism? You know, not only like setting up outreaches as far as reaching the community, but evangelism, street witnessing. Calvary Chapel Word of Life has moved into a new building where they continue to grow. We don't have any paid staff. Everybody who works as volunteers, including me, you know, I, I don't take a salary. Um, we've been doing this for 14 years like this, and God has somehow provided. And the joy we get out of is seeing people come to Jesus and seeing, you know, people's lives change because of the love we pour out in the community. Mark's past experiences with poverty, crime, and violence has prepared his heart to connect with the people caught in it today. All of these guys, they may have used to have a record, but in the eyes of God, their record is clean. Amen. The great needs of the people in Philadelphia create a perfect opportunity to reach them with the gospel. I think the church as a whole has an opportunity to meet needs in a community, you know. Paul wrote Titus and said, meet urgent needs. And so I think we have an opportunity, not only to meet needs, but develop relationships. And in those relationships, in turn, we get a chance to share the love of Jesus.